Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where we talk about Canadian history and literature, and every once in a while, have on guests. And today, we have a particularly special guest, one who is a housing policy researcher and writer living in Ottawa, and who wrote such books as Suburb Slum, Urban Village, Transformations in Parkdale, Toronto, 1875 to 2000. Boy, that's a mouthful. Um <laughs> And here to discuss her new book, Clara at the Door with a Revolver, I am happy to welcome Professor Carolyn Witzman to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Patrick. Can I just say that my last name is pronounced Weitzman? I was, I should have asked before doing it and I just shot in the dark with it and I'm sorry. So no Weitzman. problem. I mean, it, it looks like Witzman. Uh, it's just, I want to, I'm, I, I, I want it to be pronounced right, but you of can course, call me Of Carolyn. course, of course. Um, so first of all, I think we'll start with the most general question here. How would you describe your books to your book in this case to our listeners for who perhaps have no awareness of it or what it might be about? Right. So it's about a woman named Clara Ford, who in 1895 uh, was on trial for her life, accused with the mur uh, accused of the murder of a young, rich, uh, white young man who had been her next door neighbor um, previously. Uh, and the trial and, and the story behind it brings in a lot of really interesting issues that are still relevant today, ranging from uh, gender identity to um, uh, discriminatory policing uh, to um, uh, how difficult it is for a single mother to live mm. and ongoing issues of racism and homophobia. So um, when I first started reading uh, about the trial and about Clara, I just kept on thinking, wow, this is still all relevant today. And you mentioned, so when you first started reading this, so how did you actually first encounter this subject? Because I'm someone who, you know, has a show on Canadian history and who studies Canadian history and literature for school. And even then like it's not a subject that comes up. I maybe heard her name once or twice yeah. in all these years. So how did you come to engage with this particular topic? Well, my PhD, which was um, completed 20 years ago, uh, and which was eventually published as Suburb Slum, Urban Village, uh, was around um, neighborhood transition in the uh, neighborhood of uh, Parkdale, Toronto. And I lived in Parkdale, and it was obvious to me that the narrative being used by the planning department in the early, uh, in the in the late 20th century and early 21st century, which was it was a stable residential middle class suburb until um, uh, the Gardner Expressway, until the Expressway went through it, and, and apartment buildings went up. That was nonsense. There were 19th century industrial buildings. There were 19th century workers' cottages. So I was looking for media narratives, uh, both um, uh, along the whole 125 years that characterized Parkdale. And I came across this article from 1965, just at the beginning of Parkdale's gentrification that said, no, 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 this whole notion, which was already being talked about, about Parkdale being, um, you know, this homogenous suburb is nonsense. Look at the case of Clara Ford, who was accused of um, a, a black uh, low income woman who was accused of killing a white rich man who happened to live next door to her. And I went, mm -hmm, this sounds great. So then I went down this complete rabbit hole, which may be familiar to people who've done their PhDs, where mm -hmm. six weeks later, I had read every newspaper article about the trial. <laughs> and my wonderful supervisor, Richard Harris, said, stop now uh, and get back to your thesis. So I sort of um, put the story away, um, moved to Australia, where I uh, taught for 20 years, and then um, took early retirement. And part of what I wanted to do in early retirement was to write what I wanted to write. And that included returning to the story of Clara Ford because I felt it was such 
a great illustration of so many issues that I've been involved with as a, in a contemporary sense, but going back to the 19th century approaches um, around, you know, the right to the city. So um, uh, it's, uh, I've been thinking about writing this book for 20 years. Which I think shows like the, in the writing style, and we'll get into the actual content of the book later, but um, the actual way that you write it is very, you know, engaged and you clearly seem to have a passion for the actual material and it when you tell me that you've been thinking about this and researching it for almost 20 years at this point or over 20 years it shows right there's a passion there's an interest that you know few books have i would say um when you read them right especially Thank you so much yeah. patrick i really did find myself caring about clara about mm. clara's family and about just everyday issues, like how did she find enough money to pay the rent and feed her kids? And, you know, that's still an issue that I deal with, but because Clara was such a notorious character, because there were seven newspapers in Toronto at the time, I could actually answer a question I've often wondered about, which is how did 19th century single moms pay the rent and feed the kids? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the interesting aspects of your book is that it on the surface seems like a uh, you know criminal trial history or something like that but you interweave elements of urban history and you know social history and so on in a way that i find particularly interesting and what i think a lot of you know more popular history books don't necessarily tend to do and i think that's uh, definitely a, a plus of your book in this case. Um, moving on to a different question in this case, I'm curious about, you've already touched upon this, but I'm curious to hear you develop this a little bit more about some of the assumptions that you had about this topic before you started actively writing it and how did this perhaps change as you were writing or as the book was being published? Well, I was fortunate that I read the primary sources, the newspapers, before I read a little bit of the secondary literature about Clara. There isn't that much written about Clara. There's a very good article written by um, uh, Clara, uh, sorry, Carolyn uh, Strange, about um, chivalry in the trial of uh, Clara Ford, which I like a lot. Um, there was a book written about 15 years ago, again, about the trial itself, which is a pretty good legal history, but doesn't, is not interested, the, the author was not interested in Clara. When I started reading the secondary literature about Clara, it was very influenced by the memoir of a racist liar from Liarland, a fellow named um, Hector Charlesworth, who was a reporter on the case. He was 23 at the time. And in the 1920s, when he was in his 60s, he wrote his memoir and he had a, three pages on the Clara Ford trial, which he very much used to increase the circulation of the newspaper and his own fame as a journalist. And he is the source of most of the um, lies told today about the trial, that Clara bragged about the murder afterwards that um, uh, Clara murdered um, uh, Frank out of jealousy that she had mm. um, uh, been having an affair with him. Um, yeah, just, you know, nonsense. Like uh, um, there was a parade uh, uh, through the streets uh, after the trial that she, and then that she went uh, on the stage after the murder and bragged about the murder. So all of this is false, but it's been repeated uncritically because I suppose because Hector was a, a eyewitness to the trial and they didn't look at the newspapers. I mean, I was reading the world and I was going, you just made that up, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, and so um, uh, uh, I think a lot, uh, if you hear about Clara at all, you hear this story of this very strange possible mad woman who wore men's clothes and who uh, carried around guns. And sometimes she sounds like this character from the wild west that she lived at Mamie Dorsey's bar and, you know, threatened the lives of multiple men and, and all of this sort of um, nonsense uh, that, that is um, uh, very easily refuted once you dig into the historical record. Um, so I did have to, 
every time I read something in a newspaper, certainly every time I read, there, there's very little secondary literature, as I said, mm. um, every time I read something in a newspaper, I'd read something from another newspaper and I'd go, oh, that's how this story started. But, um, you know, the, a lot of it was untrue. Some of it was. True. Right. Um, but yeah, there's another thing that you can think about is a connection to the present, you know, our whole relation to the media and how it's kind of been False skewered. False news or... is another major theme uh, in this book. <laughs> I hate bringing Thank up you. that term just because it's been so overused. But yeah, yeah. it's it's unfortunate that uh, it's so pervasive yeah. today. But uh, yeah. And thinking more specifically um, of the content of the book, I'm, you know, your, your title is very evocative already of something like a clue game, right? Clara mm -hmm. at the door with a revolver yeah. and so on. And I'm I'm curious, like, why did you decide to take a more perhaps popular approach to this book compared to your more academic style, which you had, uh, which you've done throughout your career? And I'm curious, as a follow up question, how that changed your approach, perhaps to the to the actual content. I'm a great believer in popularizing ideas without simplifying them. I do it a lot in my housing work because there's a lot of jargon around housing and I try to cut through that jargon. Liberated as I was from an academic job, I really wanted to make one of those jazzy histories that people read, you know, I, it, I'm not arrogant enough to say, oh, I'm Dolores Curtin's Goodwin. I am not, you know, <laughs> but I did want to write a book that people wanted to read because the issues that I'm talking about, as I say, continue to be important today. A lot of people don't read history because it's got a lot of footnotes and it gets into long theoretical debates and that sort of thing. It was it was difficult. It, the book definitely went through three tough edits with an excellent editor, Leslie Erickson, herself a historian, um, who really, you know, we, we talked a bit about some books that we found, history books that we found very readable, um, uh, Murder in the White City, to give one example, uh, and, and how I could write that kind of a book. I mean, the other thing which um, you haven't uh, mentioned yet, but which I'll, I'll mention, uh, is that I started writing the book fairly straightforwardly, chronologically. I started off, you know, on the morning he was fatally shot, Frank Westwood felt slightly under the weather. Um, and then I went, no, it's going to take a really long time to go through the murder in the inquest before Clara comes up as a suspect. And so I, at the same time, I was sort of doing research into this, as I say, lie that um, uh, Clara uh, went on the stage afterwards and bragged about the murder. But I was fascinated by the fact that a woman who would have been 33 or 34 at the time, Clara, would have gone out um, onto the stage for the first time and what was she doing? So um, once I realized that she joined the first all black uh, vaudeville troupe and that she was a dancer and that her specialty was the cakewalk, um, I went, oh, what if this story was a bit like a three act play with an overture and a, um, a finale? And I could introduce Clara at uh, Santi Jack's uh, Creole company, um, uh, watching it uh, before she joined it in the beginning, um, just established Clara there from the start. So all of that, um, all of that actually was in the, the first draft It happened as I was writing it. And it came out of a desire to have um, Clara, so to speak, step out onto stage um, in the beginning. And I couldn't agree more with you that it's something that plagues academia, that it's very insular in its writing style and completely unapproachable for a lot of people. I remember changing my mind about that when I took a European history class, just a survey class, and the professor that I had actively had a segment of the class where he had to read a popular history book. And it was a whole engagement with that different type of writing style. And not that it's above criticism or anything like that, but that it's certainly a different way of approaching history that definitely has its benefits, especially for making history accessible to a wider audience. And I couldn't agree more with you that uh, in this case, you're 
book, I think, definitely benefits from that in terms of the writing style and in terms of just making a lot of pop history. And, you know, I'm old, so I remember growing up with Pierre Burton and, you know, that sort of Mm -hmm. um, around the time of uh, um, 1967, Canada was very nationalist and interested in developing a national history. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of that national history, of course, was um, bound up in myths that we are fortunately beginning to address, such as, you know, colonialism being a positive force, uh, the the dispossession of Indigenous people, and also that Canada was so much morally better than the US, da da da, you know. So um, uh, I think we need a new generation. Again, I'm not going to say I'm Pierre Burton. I'm not, I, I'm never going to write <laughs> as much as he did. Um, but, you know, a new generation of populist history that's unapologetically Canadian, but that also starts to take on some of the myths that we've been promulgating for a really long time. Absolutely. Um, Getting into a bit of the trial in this case, um, I'm curious. So Clara, as you've alluded to throughout uh, some of these questions, was not, I would say, a conventional case, so to speak, right? She's a self-representing Black woman. Uh, Her sexuality and gender was subject to debate, and uh, at the time at least, and, you know, the way that she dressed and so forth was very much not within the norms of society at the time in Toronto. Um, And I'm curious, how was this approached during her trial? Like, how did people actually engage with the fact that she was not necessarily what people would expect, right? Even before her preliminary hearing, the first reaction when she was arrested and she was arrested completely out of the blue after the inquest had said murder by a person or people unknown. Um, So it was a bolt from the blue when this, as you say, black cross-dressing person is um, uh, arrested. And of course the, the media went wild and, you know, the majority of the newspapers certainly over the week between her arrest and her preliminary hearing Um, It just, you know, they gathered every rumor, every detail that they could. Um, So even before the trial, there were newspapers that were on her side and there were newspapers that were out to get her. Uh, Some of the newspapers that were on her side began to build up even before the um, uh, the preliminary hearing, uh, her confession, they were calling it a forced confession, etc. So there was a lot of debate going on, really interesting debates about the rights of accused people, about um, the behavior of the police, and also about Clara herself, because Clara combined two 19th century um, tropes. The first trope was crazy threat to society must put down but there was a second trope that she fit into which was hard-working respectable poor person like a lot was made in the newspapers that were sympathetic to her that she worked 12-hour days six days a week that her employer said that she were she was um, a hard worker um, even though she clearly had um, at least one daughter out of wedlock she actually had two daughters um, but they only mentioned one ended up testifying against her Um, they were sort of willing to go, oh, that was a misstep in her youth, and she she doesn't seem to drink very much, and she doesn't seem to, like, she goes out to the theater, but she doesn't seem to be, you know, um, leading a wild life, so maybe, maybe a nice, respectable person like that can't be a murderer, which is nonsense, of course, respectable people can and are um, uh, uh, murderers, but, um, you know, that there was this whole media debate about her very character that was playing out in the six months between her arrest and the trial. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, this idea of morality is obviously extremely pervasive in any narrative of Victorian (laughs) times. So yeah, I'm not surprised that in this case- I had a dollar for every time I used the word respectable. I mean, usually in a quote, I would be rich. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And I'm curious, in this case, so we're talking about, you know, a trial in which 
race and gender relations and class play heavily in this case. And I'm curious, considering the the, the clout or the, the, just the traction that this trial got at the time in terms of publicity and people paying attention to it, I'm curious why you think there aren't more uh, discussions of this book. As you mentioned, there are very few uh, sources today that actually talk about this trial. Um, and it's not like we are unfamiliar with other racialized trials. Like, for example, Louis Riel's trial is one that's very famous in Canadian history. So I'm curious why you think this one in and particular is not overlap of lawyers. Osler was the fellow. That's who, true um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, I think in general, the history of Black people in Canada needs a lot more emphasis. So looking at Toronto alone, you have uh, uh, Wilson Abbott who um, developed the downtown area later known as um, the ward. You mm -hmm. have, um, you know, pioneering Black uh, journalists. You have um, the, the Hubbard, who was a deputy mayor of um, Toronto in the 1890s and who was Black. Um, so we don't know that much about the complex history of Black people in Toronto or across Canada. Um, in Toronto, there were 500 Black people in um, the 1860s uh, in uh, Toronto, there were 500 Black people in the 1890s. So like many Canadians, um, mm -hmm. Black Canadians moved to the U.S. In many cases, they've been refugees, so they moved back to the U.S. But we don't know either that story of a group, nor do we know the story of particularly interesting exemplary individuals. Um, that's one problem. Um, the other problem is that, you know, there still is a bit of a tendency to focus on the great men, you know, there and, and there's a debate now, which is great, about mm -hmm. Ryerson, about John A. Macdonald, about George Brown. You know, these are all uh, really important figures, but there are a lot of other important figures who didn't have that wealth and power and gender and everything like that. Um, so, you know, we're still, as I say, we're, we're catching up in Canada on popular social history. Absolutely. And despite the work, as you were saying, of people like Pierre Burton, there's still a great deal of, um, of dark spots in our history that either, you know, there are very little sources because of the realities of the time or in which we just haven't thought of looking into. So, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. One of the books that I read when I first came back to Canada, because I've only been back in Canada since 2019, was okay. um, The Northwest is Our Mother. And it oh. blew my mind. It absolutely, I love that book so much. Oh, I love that book. And talk about a readable history. And, and you know, because I'd grown up in the 70s, um, I still had this notion that Louis Riel was a madman, you know, mm -hmm. and and then I, I was, I hadn't read that much in the interim. So thank goodness, there's wonderful history that's coming up that's both corrective um, in terms of um, people who are somewhat famous, and then also corrective in terms of bringing um, uh, groups and um, individuals um, yeah. to the forefront of um, a stage that they were previously excluded from. There's there's a passage in that book, The Northwest is Our Mother, that I think is imprinted on in my mind and I think perfectly encapsulates what you're talking about here, where uh, Jean Teye mentions that the only people who cared about Louis Riel's sanity or insanity are English Canadian historians. And that kind of struck me because it, it very much represents a the formation of history, how history is created and by whom, right? But also the realities of, well, who others, uh, what other histories are forgotten? Well, you forget Métis histories who care, who, uh, you know, in, in that version of history, you don't look at French Canadian history in general, which uh, is very interested in Louis Hiel, for example. So all of these other histories, and this is something that you bring up in your book as well, is you know, are are just as valid, right? And we need to we need to acknowledge them. Absolutely. Um, thinking 
uh, about Clara Ford specifically, right? Uh, bringing it back, if you will, to that uh, to this topic. Um, we talked a little bit about her, uh, how people engage with her publicly, but I'm curious more about her personal life as well. So do we know much about how this trial impacted her personally or direct relations in her life and how her own personal life kind of played out during this trial? Well, we know a lot more about Clara than we would about any other working class or black woman of that time, I'd say in Canada. Um, we know that um, she had a loving relationship with her mother who died just before the murder. Until the book that I wrote, there'd been this assumption that Jesse Mackay um, adopted Clara out of the kindness of her heart, lost her position as a servant, became an extremely poor woman who was probably homeless with her daughter at several points yeah. because she was an aging spinster and she wanted to have a kid. I'm like, I don't think that passes the smell test. So I've, I've got, uh -huh. um, I suggest, strongly suggest that um, Jessie was her um, natural mother, but whether um, she was um, biological mother of um, Clara or not, Jessie Mackay was a white woman. Uh, the uh, relationship between uh, Clara and her um, mother, uh, you can get lots of hints again about how there's three generations of single mothers in this story, um, how they coped, how they how they managed. I mean, um, Jesse had to become a servant at a very young age. Uh, Clara had to leave school at 12 and become a servant, um, a barmaid. Uh, and then um, uh, in turn, uh, Clara's daughter, Flora, had to become a servant um, at the age of 12, if she made it to 12, um, uh, without going out into paid labor. So we know a little bit about how they live together, how they balance childcare and work. And then um, Clara had a series of friendships with her landladies, for lack of a better word. They tended to be older white women who had many children. And I think that Clara really appears to have been attracted to um, maternal women. Um, I'm not going to speculate about Clara's sexuality because it's impossible to do that. Um, Clara had two children, um, but men don't appear to have been a long-term part of her life. Um, there's also the intriguing friendship between Clara and uh, Eliza Reed, um, who was a fellow boarder of hers, like Clara, a single mother, 28, she had an eight-year-old child um, who lived in the same boarding house as Clara and who testified, was one of uh, Clara's alibi witnesses. Um, not much is known about Eliza Reed, including what her race was assumed to be. Um, I'm going to assume that she lived uh, in a, a boarding house run by a black woman, worked in the um, uh, restaurant downstairs that she was mixed race uh, as uh, Clara was. So again, there's some things that we can know, some some details of Clara's friendship. She had, she definitely, she had friendships with um, a number of uh, women. Um, I think that more credence was given to the words of the white women rather than the black women. And Clara's landlady at the time of the murder, in particular, Chloe Dorsey, was um, mocked uh, for her appearance, accent, um, etc. despite, Unclear, as, yeah. as uh, Chloe Dorsey herself said, I've been in Toronto since before it was called Toronto. I mm -hmm. taught, you know, um, do not treat me with disrespect. That's what she said during and after the trial when she was treated with disrespect. Um, so unfortunately, we know less about Clara's relationship with other Black and mixed race women than we do a better relationship with white women. But at least we have a portrait of um, friendships with some unequal power relationships attached that I find fascinating because I'm always interested in stories of women's friendships. And there's very little historical record of that. Absolutely. And thinking a little bit more broadly or uh, extrapolating perhaps from Clara's life, I, I always found it interesting. And this is something I brought up when I talked with George Elliott Clark on the show as well. Um, 
that in Canada, when we think of Black history, we often seem to go from the end of slavery in the, be the beginning of the 19th century, and then we kind of skip to the civil rights movement. Right. And we don't talk a lot about the end of the 19th what century. What happened during those 130 years? <laughs> Nobody knows. Apparently nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm curious, um, you know, uh, both through your book and just your general research that you've done uh, in this topic, like what can Clara Ford's life tell us about uh, just working class uh, Black women or Black people in general? in Toronto during the late 19th century, because I think it's a forgotten or unexplored part of Canadian history. So what can her life tell us about uh, Black lives in the 19, uh, end of the 19th century? I guess one of the things that really struck me about the newspaper reporting is how visible Clara was, how much she was under constant scrutiny and being judged, because there's no way that in the day between her being arrested and the you know, blanket coverage starting, mm. that um, some of the anecdotes are made up and some of the anecdotes are completely taken out of context. For instance, um, uh, Clara was said to have uh, been harassed on a streetcar, um, although they were using, you know, um, uh, insulted, let's say, uh, you know, very um, teased um, uh, language. And she went out and uh, got off on the same stop as two men who were teasing her and um, uh, hit one of them. And that got turned by the newspapers into she um, uh, is a professional um, uh, boxer, you know, like a, they just sort of took it way oh, out wow. of context. <laughs> but, you know, how do they find out within a day of that incident? unless she is constantly being viewed and judged and um, uh, stories are being told about her and she's being stared at in the street and she's being pointed at. There's a number mm -hmm. of stories where, you know, they're pointing at her. What is she doing in Parkdale? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so I'd say that, you know, Clara would have been under constant scrutiny. I think that generally, um, uh, you know, as I show in the book, uh, through the story of the Dorsey family, um, there was a lot of interaction with the law. Uh, in some cases, they were plaintiffs. In other cases, they were def uh, defendants. But there's absolutely no doubt. And I mean, Barrington Walker has written some really good stuff about this, right. that um, you know, the police were keeping an eye on uh, York Street. They were very happy to arrest people. They were very happy to give longer sentences, um, uh, the magistrate, uh, et cetera. So, um, and, and much poorer treatment in prison, although I cut out that bit. Um, so um, uh, there's no doubt that uh, there was differential uh, treatment by the police, but also that, um, you know, they were a small minority by um, uh, uh, the late 19th century, and they were constantly being watched and judged, which is no way to live. Absolutely. I actually just finished reading a book by, I'm going to forget the author's name, um, Keith Smith, right, um, who talks about similar ideas, but with a different set of racialized communities with the indigenous in Western Canada. Um, and he, it's the book, um, liberalism, surveillance and resistance, um, uh, indigenous communities in Western Canada. And he talks about this period as well. And I see a lot of parallels with what you're talking about with the way that, you know, certain minority communities were watched both by official systems, right? The police, the government, and so on, but also in which communities self-policed and, um, uh, you know, and interacted with minority communities in a way that encouraged this kind of surveillance and uh, kind of pushed people to act in a certain way, uh, according to what was considered the standard uh, at the time. And I see a lot of parallels in this case with what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, and Robin Maynard has written very well yes. about this as well. So yes, I, nothing that I'm saying is particularly new or revolutionary. I guess the one contribution I feel this book um, makes is that because because Clara was so notorious for a short period of time, she's able to be fleshed out a lot more mm. than 
a working class black woman would be under normal circumstances. Not a good situation for Clara, who is essentially um, a, a quiet and retiring person. Um, even though she was very funny, she was clearly an introvert. Um, but very fortunate for the historian. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, bringing is, uh, I want to bring this a little bit closer to your original type of, uh, to type of studies in geography and housing and so on. And I'm curious in what way does this history tell us about, uh, Toronto's relation with, uh, housing and, uh, the way that the city is organized perhaps, right? Cause you mentioned something particularly interesting to at the beginning of our interview, where you mentioned that the victim was a former neighbor of Clara's, right? Which might strike certain people odd that someone who's more well-to-do would be neighbors with someone who's more working class and of a different race and so on. And so I'm curious, like, what kind of discussion we could have about uh, housing policy and... Mm -hmm just urban organization in Toronto at this time? Well, this very much comes out of my book on Parkdale, uh, mm -hmm. where in the early years of Parkdale, from its incorporation in um, 1875 to 1900, um, people bought houses and then immediately rented out bits of the houses in order to make them affordable, plus um, if, uh, as in the case of the Clark family, who were the um, landlady, uh, Catherine Clark was the landlady of Clara Ford, um, she was left widowed with uh, nine children, and um, she uh, was trying to sell the house in the 1890s. There was a recession. In the meantime, she was very happy to um, provide the stables, basically the former stables that, that had... Um, room for a groom to live uh, to, um, they didn't have horses any more, the Clarks, they had been driven into genteel poverty uh, to um, uh, Clara, Clara's mother and Clara's two daughters. Um, and it would appear that they did that for, um, in return for housework, particularly um, Clara helping with the dying uh, pedophilias, which, you know, exchanging accommodation for unpaid labor is, you know, a, a form of servitude, right? It's a form uh -huh. of uh, it's slavery. Uh, absolutely, mm -hmm. it's sketchy. So um, uh, not only uh, were the Westwoods, who were a rich family, living right on the waterfront next to the Clarks, who had been a rich family, but were no longer a rich family um, uh, in Parkdale, but a lot of their neighbors are renters and lodgers um, living in grand houses that, are um, uh, almost immediately um, being converted into lodging houses. Um, and that's not unusual for Toronto or for Canada during that period. Uh, it's just, we, we look at the physical, um, well, not on um, Jameson because it's all apartment buildings now, but we look sure. at the physical, physical legacy of fairly large houses and we go, middle-class people live there, but actually, salesmen live there and mm -hmm. um you know uh, uh relatively low-income journalists live there um and they they shared the house you know uh and that was the only way that um uh if a um wife or a daughter inherited it was a respectable living to be a, a boarding house um uh, owner so i was very interested in that and i talk about that in my thesis slash uh, parkdale book and i also talk about it in the clara story but I also was fascinated with what's the kind of housing that Jesse could afford in the 1860s, 1870s, when uh, Clara is um, growing up. And what they could afford were these little jerry-built houses, these, these um, third-class condition, as the assessment records call them, uh, shacks that are um, barely one room. At one point, Jesse um, has a boarding mm -hmm. house, but if you look at the assessment record, it's maximum two rooms. So there have to have been three strangers living in one room and uh, Clara, uh, Jesse living in another room. And that would have been, you know, difficult and not private circumstances for Clara to be growing up in. And whenever possible, I was trying to find what was the weekly or monthly rent 
that was being paid against the wage and it wasn't computing, which is something I talk about in the book. Absolutely. And I'm curious, we mentioned this a little bit uh, throughout that obviously this has, you know, we, we see parallels today with the way that Clara was treated and, um, you know, just black lives in general, right, uh, that continue to face hardships in today's Canada, to put it in a diplomatic term. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious, thinking about the story in particular, what do you see as its particular relevance to today? And thinking more broadly, you know, can this help us think about the legacy of this trial um, to this very day? If there is, yeah. I mean, one of the frustrations for me is that I think um, the check on police uh, discriminatory uh, practices and uh, was there was a temporary check on um, Mm -hmm. the police just doing things by their own rules, Um, and then like an elastic, it kind of snapped back. And I do end the book with a little bit of a a paragraph long rant about how things haven't changed that, you know, single mums on um, uh, are, are still, um, uh, if they're on social assistance, um, and it's possible that uh, Clara's mom got some um, welfare help at uh, some point, um, they're, they're considered bad mums. If they are neglecting their kids, they're considered bad mums. If they can't provide housing, um, they are, um, uh, their kids can be taken away. Uh, the um, there is still fairly constant evidence of um, discriminatory police practices. Um, there is uh, still this really smug assumption that because Canada is superior in some ways to the U.S. and that's a pretty mm-hmm. low bar that Canada is this extraordinarily morally superior place, which it is not. Um, and there's still this, you know, there's still some very active othering going on. So some things have changed in 125 years and way too much has not changed. Absolutely. Um, and I'm curious, kind of winding this down, um, what, in your opinion, was your favorite part of the book to, uh, to write? And if you want to read a section of the book, yeah, that's uh, totally up to you uh, at this point if you want to I'm, I'm kind of... happy to and I and you'd mentioned it but I'd forgotten but I would love an opportunity to read a few pages if that's okay good um so I'm going to read from the judges summing up and the end of the trial uh and you need to know that the judge in this case um he called himself the chancellor john alexander boyd he's a bad man his Mm -hmm. ruling in the saint catherine mills case set back indigenous rights by 100 years but more importantly he hated being a criminal trial he he liked property law and he was not happy being there and it shows um so he was a bad judge um and then um uh osler who had um been the fellow who um uh handled the um uh prosecution of Louis Riel. Actually, his wife had died earlier in the week of the trial, and so he had to step away. And the fellow who stepped up, in the judge's opinion, wasn't... um, uh, The the judge felt that he wasn't doing a good enough job of making sure that Clara hanged. Okay. Um, With that, the court adjourned for dinner, and the judge prepared his instructions for the jury. While waiting for the courtroom to once again be brought to order, the Globe reporter glanced around the room. The judicially stern yet kindly face of the chancellor on the bench arranging his notes. The 12 pale and tired looking jurors who would decide life or death. The serried mass of spectators, silent, eager, attentive, following every word. And lastly, the prisoner herself, the mulatto girl whose life hung in the balance whose fate depended on the decision of that dozen of men before her. For the first time, she showed some emotion, but even now it was scarcely perceptible. The mouth was slightly drawn and the eyelids drooped, as if in the very weariness of spirit. But beyond this, the prisoner at the bar was apparently the least concerned of any in that packed courtroom. As the judge would understate in its coverage of Chancellor Boyd's summation, the judge charged adversely to the jury. 
it's possible that Boyd felt he needed to present the Crown's case since Osler was absent and Dewar was, in the Chancellor's opinion, not up to the task. There can be no other explanation for the next 35 minutes. Boyd began by reminding the jury that they must not be actuated by sympathy or compassion. Rather, they must answer the question, has the crime been brought home to the prisoner? He then turned to the reputation of the police, praising them in the backhanded manner of the privilege. A good deal has been said about detectives and police officers. If we had no crime in this country, we would not need these officials. But so long as we have crime, we must have detectives. Without detectives, there would be no security of life or property or stability of the social fabric. While both deceased and the prisoner have good characters, so far as we've heard, there is the writing of the letters. According to Boyd, the letters destroyed the character of Clara Ford, the angry black woman, but not the alleged source of gossip, Frank, the respectable white boy. The prisoner said that she didn't know young Westwood, but there's evidence that she did know him. There's evidence that she spoke to him, and there's testimony that she told Mrs. Crozier she knew him since he was so high. The Crown hadn't mentioned this testimony, but the judge felt it was incumbent upon him to remind jurors of this fact. Boyd continued by reminding the jury that Frank Westwood had said in his antemortem statement that it was a man who shot him, a man dressed in dark clothes and a fedora hat, medium height and middle age, wearing a dark mustache. He said, too, that he wasn't in any girl scrape. They must judge if this statement cleared Clara Ford or not. Boyd pounced pointed out, however, that in her confession, Clara had said she'd been wearing men's clothes. In addition, the shooting happened in an instant. It was dark and the light in the hall may not have illuminated the shooter, the shooter's face. The Crown hadn't argued this last point, but the judge was there to help the jury make the correct conclusion. In the most dismissive manner possible, Boyd brought back the allegation of sexual assault as a motive. The confession said that Frank had insulted her. A good many young men are very good at home in quite different a way. It may be that Westwood didn't remember the assault or didn't place much importance on the fact and consequently didn't associate her with the tragedy. Or he might have suspected that it was her and didn't want to grieve his parents by associating her name with the tragedy. According to the judge, assault against Black women was so commonplace as to be forgettable and certainly not noteworthy. The Crown hadn't presented these scenarios of Frank forgetting or dismissing the assault or conversely shielding Clara because he felt guilt. Perhaps the judge felt he was helping to clean up after the Crown left the party. Boyd reiterated the Crown's point that Frank's antemortem statement cleared Gus Clark. There were no other suspects besides Clara and Boyd characterized her alleged confession as singular as was the fact that she entered the box to explain it away. A great deal has been said about the bravery of the prisoner in going into the witness box, but you're not to pay any attention to that. Remember, a man or a woman will do anything to save his or her life. To illustrate the point, Boyd brought up the old saying, skin for skin, yes, all a man has, he will give for life. The Chancellor didn't mention that he was citing Satan in the Book of Job to back up his arguments. What value Boyd con continued rhetorically under these circumstances could the jury place on her testimony? The jury was instructed not to sweep away all the other evidence without due consideration. The detectives were men with long experience in the force. Is this prisoner a woman to be awed by this questioning? Or is she, on the other hand, not a woman to make up a story of this kind? Boyd implied that the answer didn't need to be stated. Then Boyd wheeled out his big cannons. I am bound to tell you that if those officers treated that woman as she swears they did, they deserve to be behind prison bars. But these women have been four, these men have been four, eight, ten, and twenty years upon the force have hitherto borne unblemished characters, and it is a grave thing to incriminate them based on the unsupported te testimony of one who stands charged as a prisoner does. Acquitting Clara would mean convicting the detectives, and the police were in jail. If the police were in jail, then who would maintain social order? Boyd dismissed the contention that the accused would not attempt to pass by the waterfront. If she committed the crime, she wouldn't hesitate to walk through a foot of cold water in October. He concluded, by suggesting in regard to his deferred judgment. If they found the prisoner guilty, it was advisable that they should state whether they should have been disposed to find her guilty if the evidence of her confession had not been admitted. The jury filed out of the courtroom at 8.35 to the sound of shock silence. Johnson slowly stood and respectfully asked the judge whether he might want to recall the jury to define reasonable doubt and remind them of the defense's version of events. These were, of course, legal requirements in summing up a case. The chancellor grimaced and asked the bailiff to bring the jury back. 
Then he read excerpts from the testimony of Eliza, who'd said Clara had returned to their home at approximately the same time as the shooting, and William Graham, who'd said he'd sold tickets, uh, sold Clara theater tickets and saw her in the theater and on the street that night. Boyd explained that the jury must weigh the evidence. If it was evenly balanced, the prisoner should have the benefit of the doubt. He glanced at Johnson for approval and sent the jury out again to deliberate at 8.55 p.m. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that and very indicative of the way that power perpetuates itself in these kinds of situations, right? Just subtly reminding the society what police are for, right? The, mm -hmm. That social order would collapse if not for them. What would happen if we didn't have what the would police? Happen? Yeah, I, who's to say? But, um, and I particularly like the accidental Satan quote. That is peak uh, comedy right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had fun making fun of um, Judge Boyd, definitely. Oh, yeah, that, that shows, definitely. And rightfully so. And uh, before, we, be, before we finish today, I'm curious. Um, this is something that I always ask all the guests that I have uh, on the show and is deliberately a question that I did not send you. But I'm curious, what didn't I ask you today? And what's the answer to that question? Ooh, I, I'm not sure I have. It was a very thorough interview. It's so nice to kind of, you know, put your um, uh, toes into the shag carpet of an hour long interview. Um, where is the book available? I mean, that was my next question, but there you go. Okay. How about you tell people where the book is available and perhaps what your next writing projects are? Oh, I'd love to talk about my next writing projects, Absolutely. actually. So thank you. And, and I'm sorry, I completely... That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'm not interviewing myself. Um, okay. Uh, so the book is available February 1st. Um, mm -hmm. The first place I suggest you go is UBC Press, but do go to your finer independent bookstores, or if they aren't available, rock up the chapters or Indigo and say, um, where's that Clara Ford book? Because I, it's not really a book that's going to wind up in the academic bookstores, I don't think. I, I'm hoping it's going to be a book that people read and think about Canadian history in a new way. My next book is completely different. I'm actually writing it right now, and it's called How to Home. And it's about Canada's housing crisis. So it's it's a little bit more in my day-to-day -day, uh, work. But again, I, I think that um, housing policy, like Canadian history, um, has a lot of um, hard to, it's complicated. It has a lot of hard to understand jargon, but there are solutions out there to the housing crisis. And I want to talk about those solutions. So it's a two book deal with UBC Press. It always has been. UBC Press has been a good press for me to work with. And um, yeah, I'm busy at work on my next uh, book, which should be out next year sometime. I'm looking forward to it as someone who is starting to think about a home that they would like to buy and despairing at the state of the housing market in Canada. I would be very interested in reading that. <laughs> that book. But absolutely, I encourage listeners to check out Clara at the Door with a Revolver and uh, very, very highly recommended. And we will definitely link it in the show notes uh, for when it comes out. So thank you so much, Patrick. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I uh, am happy to have you on the show again, maybe for a book on housing. And um, <laughs> Yeah, and honestly, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Clara Weitzman. See, I pronounced it properly. Yeah, but this time you called me Clara Weitzman. Damn it. <laughs> You'll get it, Patrick. You'll get it. <laughs> I'm not editing this out. I'm gonna I'm gonna revel in my shame of this one. Carolyn Weitz. <laughs> We kept repeating Clara. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. My namesake was named Clara, actually. So it's it's not uh, completely uh, yeah. out of line. All right. But thank you very much for being on the show and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too, Patrick.